Uh, and I think it's an in indication of the importance of this issue that the leaders of the Internet Caucus are not actually from some of the, the uh, highest developing uh, areas in the country, like the Silicon Valley. They're from rural America. Even uh, Senator Burns and Senator Leahy are from Vermont and Montana. It's a nationwide issue. It affects everybody. And this issue of all points that out most clearly. Please welcome my friend and colleague, your voucher. Congressman Goodlatte, thank you very much for those kind words. And I want to join with you in welcoming such a large attendance at this Internet Caucus Forum. I am personally delighted to see that the attendance at our various forums on a range of Internet-related issues continues to grow. Uh, we are now the largest single caucus in the Congress. We are also the most active single caucus in the Congress. And I particularly want to welcome each of you today to the discussion that we have on this very important topic of efforts to stimulate broadband deployment. As Bob mentioned, I am pleased to be one of the co-authors of the Toes and Dingle Good Life Voucher Measure. And, uh, and I think there are three very important public policy justifications for the passage of this measure. And I hope that you will uh, bear these justifications in mind as the Toes and Dingle Bill comes to the floor of the House uh, before the end of this month. First of all, uh, this is a way to reduce the cost of high-speed internet access in broad swaths of rural America. I represent a, a very uh, rural district in the western part of Virginia. We have uh, 23 counties and cities. Uh, it is the home, notably, to Virginia Tech, which is a very advanced uh, technology-oriented uh, university. Uh, it's uh, a very wired place. But inside my congressional district, we do not have a single internet point of presence. There is not a single major internet hub. And what that means is that the cost of obtaining high-speed internet access, whether you're a business or whether you're a major research university like Virginia Tech, is much higher than it would be if we were situated nearer major internet points of presence. So the absence of a sufficient number of hubs means that the cost of getting high-speed internet access is dramatically higher. Now, why is it higher? Well, it's higher because when you have hubs that are located nearby, uh, in the length of the dedicated line that brings that high-speed high access to you can be far shorter. And the shorter the length of that dedicated line, the lower the cost, and therefore the lower the price of the high-speed access. There is a direct correlation between the absence of the high-speed hubs uh, in rural areas and the presence of Bell operating companies in these rural areas. And the reason that there is this direct correlation is because the Bell operating companies simply do not have the economic case to make to deploy hubs in areas where they cannot carry uh, the traffic, where they cannot carry the data beyond that hub into the Internet backbone. If they have to hand that data off, there's very little reason for them to build the hub in the first place. The Toes and Dingle Bill would resolve that problem and would result in greater investment in Internet hubs throughout rural America by allowing the Bell operating companies to carry data on a nationwide basis immediately. And by being able to do that, uh, they would have the incentive to invest in the hubs and the points of presence that would significantly reduce the cost of high-speed internet access throughout rural America. And so that's point number one. Number two, this measure would also encourage a more rapid deployment of DSL services in the areas that are served by the Bell operating companies. If they can carry the data traffic from the originating DSL customer, through the internet backbone, they can maximize their investment and the revenue that they get from the investment in the DSL service to begin with. We would like to see DSL deployed more rapidly. The cable industry has about 70% of the national broadband market today. DSL has approximately the other 30%. And one of the reasons that the cable industry has such a large share of this market is the presence of so much regulation on the DSL side. But it's also the fact that Bell operating companies are simply not able to carry the traffic very far beyond their originating user. They have to hand it off when it crosses a ladder boundary to some other carrier. If we enable them to become owners of the internet backbone, we resolve that problem and give them a much greater economic incentive 
to deploy DSL more rapidly. A third major reason to support this measure is that it will create greater competition in the internet backbone ownership. Uh, today, there is concentration in that market that is growing every day. The result is higher pricing for internet backbone services. And the result of that is that the bills the internet service providers get for backbone access increase. And with those increases, we as internet users and internet customers <coughs> also have increases in the bills that we're having to pay to our internet service providers. Every bill that we pay to an ISP for that monthly service contains a component for internet backbone access. As more competition comes into the backbone with Bell companies being able to have ownership in that market, that will favorably affect pricing all the way down the chain to the internet user. And that's a third major reason to support this measure. I would assign as a fourth major reason to support the bill the fact that we need to achieve regulatory parity in the broadband market. Today, the cable industry offers its cable modem service essentially without regulation. Yes, cable companies have to get a local franchise in order to deploy their multi-channel video service. But once they've done that, they're free to offer cable modem service essentially unhindered, unfettered by government in any way. There are no regulations that attend the offering of that service. By contrast, on the telephone side, when a company offers DSL service, there are multiple regulations that apply. And those regulations all carry a cost. And the net result is that the telephone company with its DSL service only has about 30% of the broadband market at the present time. Cable has the other 70%. Regulatory parity would encourage a more rapid deployment of DSL uh, by the telephone industry, and that would uh, help achieve one of our great national goals of encouraging greater broadband deployment. Those who oppose this bill have made a, a number of arguments, and I'm going to take just a moment this morning uh, to respond to a couple of those arguments. First of all, they say that the local telephone market is not open to competition today. And let me uh, say that the local market is truly open to competition at the present time. Evidence of that fact is that the business market today is becoming quite competitive. Approximately 40% of all businesses around the United States are served by competitive local telephone carriers. The residential market is very different. And you'll hear people say, perhaps even today, that the Bell companies and other incumbent local telephone companies currently control about 94% of the local telephone line. When they use that figure, they're talking about the residential market. And in point of fact, competitors only have about 6% of the residences across the country. Why the difference? Well, there is a major difference. First of all, the rules of access are the same. If a competitor wants to serve the business market or the residential market, he has exactly the same opportunity under the law to serve either. And so the rules of access are the same. But the profits to be made are on the business side. Business telephone rates are inflated today, primarily because the telephone companies are able to use a lot of those revenues in order to subsidize and support residential local telephone service. And so the business rates are very much above the cost of providing that service. There's a significant margin of profit. That is not true with regard to residential telephone rates. Those rates uh, very often are below the cost of providing the service. In fact, on a nationwide basis, 40% of the residences in the country have telephone rates that are below the cost of providing the service. And so a competitor looking at this market is going to go where the profit can be made. The competitor is going to go to the business market where the very high margins between cost and current market charges exist. And that's why the business market is about 40% competitive at the present time, with 40% being served by local exchange carriers, by competitive local exchange carriers. In the cities, uh, that number often is 50% or higher. Uh, Bell South, in fact, testified before the House Judiciary Committee earlier this week that in the city of Atlanta, uh, competitors are now serving 50% of the businesses in that city. So the market is open. It is open to competition. You can look at the amount of competition in the business market as clear evidence of that fact. Another claim that is made by uh, the, the opponents of the Tozen-Bingle legislation 
is that if the bill is adopted, uh, the incentives would be taken away for the bell operating companies to maintain an open uh, and competitive local public <coughs> market. And I have two responses to that. First of all, the incentives would be great for a continuation of uh, a maintenance of the open and competitive nature of the market. What the bill does is say that bell operating companies may immediately offer data across the latter boundaries. They can carry internet traffic on a nationwide basis. The bill would lead to the regular regulatory process under Section 271 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the freedom for bell operating companies to offer voice-based long distance on a nationwide basis. They would still have to get the regular regulatory approval in order to offer that. And that regulatory approval only comes uh, when they take the steps that are required in the law uh, to have an open and competitive local market. Now, what incentive would they have? Would they have a sufficient incentive to do that if we allow them to offer data immediately? Would they have a sufficient incentive if all that they have remaining is the voice-based long-distance market? You bet they would. The voice-based long-distance market on a nationwide basis is about a $100 billion market each year. $100 billion. It is one of the largest markets in dollar value that we have for any product or service in the United States. And so there is ample incentive remaining for the Bell operating companies to take all of the steps necessary to assure that the local telephone market is open and competitive in order to get access to this $100 billion uh, market. The second major point is that there is already a direct legal requirement that the Bell operating companies have an open and competitive market incentives aside. Under Section 251 of the 1996 Telecommunications Act, the Bell companies are required to offer interconnection opportunities. And so any company that wants to build its own facilities can interconnect anywhere with the Bell company's network and offer a competitive service. If a competitor doesn't want to uh, have uh, its own facilities, it can lease the entire Bell company network and do so at about a 30% discount and then resell that service. And a 30% margin within which to make a profit uh, is very generous. It can also, if it doesn't want to lease the entire network, lease individual pieces of it. We call those unbundled network elements. And individual pieces of those can be leased in the event that the competitor doesn't want to lease the entire network. So it can have a combination of resale and facilities basis competition. It can also, if it wants to offer DSL service, lawn chair over the copper loops uh, of the uh, incumbent providers. That, I think, is a sufficient answer to a complaint that uh, if this bill passes, there would be a lessening of the opportunity for an open exchange competition. It is in the public interest. I'm pleased to strongly support it, and I appreciate your taking some time this afternoon to listen to these arguments uh, in support of the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, obviously, a very eloquent explanation of the virtues of the legislation. Um, what you're, the organizers of this um, session have done is to, to try to present alternating points of view. So that's what we will have next in the person of Congressman Steve Largent, uh, who came to Congress in 1994 following his memorable time as a record setting patch receiver in the National Football League, uh, which won him membership in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. He serves on the House Commerce Committee, where he is Vice Chairman of the Energy and Air Quality Committee, a subcommittee. He's also a member of the Telecom and Internet Subcommittee, where on the legislative debate before us today, I can tell you he's been a rather vocal skeptic of the merits of this housing legal legislation. I also have to say that it's my job when I go around the country, I speak to institutional investors all over the country, and I can talk about members of Congress that are just second nature to all of you, but as soon as I mention, but they're, they're blank like as far as people outside of Washington are concerned. As soon as I mention Steve Large and all the guys in the room, heads start bobbing up and down, they start talking about his football career, and I just say, guys, I know that's more fun than talking about unbundled network elements, but that's what we're supposed to talk about today. Anyway, Congressman Large, thanks. Thank you very much. As you guys probably know, I think there's a vote occurring on the floor right now, so I'll be very brief so I give Billy his time before we have to get up and vote. Um, 
it's interesting that the introduction was about my athletic career because as I have thought and uh, battled through the various issues that underlie uh, this Dingle Tozan HR 1542, uh, it's actually the competitive issue in this bill that is my greatest concern. I don't know about you guys, but the way that I measure my touch with reality and uh, maintenance of my own sanity as a member of Congress is very easy, and that is, do I still read the sports page first, and do I watch ESPN more than I watch C-SPAN? And as long as I'm doing those things, I know that I'm still in touch with reality. And uh, so I don't know how many of you got a chance to watch the basketball game last night. I did. I watched the second half. And uh, in many respects, I feel like that what we're doing with HR 1542 would be comparable to, say, the L.A. Lakers coming out at halftime and having worked the commissioner of the NBA and said, you know, we really want to ban any player that's under six foot one in the league for the rest of the series. And basically, what they would be trying to do is changing the rules of the game in the middle of the game, which is what, in my view, is what HR 1542 did, or is trying to do. Uh, we passed the Telecommunications Act, which I think was a, a very important bill for the telecommunications industry. Uh, has actually been a catalyst for the economic growth that we've experienced in our country for the last five years. Uh, very important legislation. You know, we uh, Republicans in particular talk about welfare reform and tax cuts and balanced budget. But I will tell you that this, as much as anything else that we've done, has been critical, I think, for the growth of our economy. Um, and I think in, in light of that, uh, we passed in the Telecommunications Act a bill that said what we want to do is create competition in every area, in the local loops, in long distance, in cable, in satellite, and so on and so forth. Uh, the one area that we have seen we have had the least competition is really still in that local loop. Uh, Congressman Boucher talked about the local loop still being dominated by the Bell Companies. Ninety-four percent of residential uh, homes are still served, including my home in Tulsa, still served by Bell Companies only, exclusively, no competition, no choice. And my fear is, is that if we change the rules in the middle of the game with HR 1542, we will hamper and hamstring the ability to have competition in that local loop even more so. Uh, and that really is, is uh, my total take on what we're, what we're doing here. Because in fact, in the Telecommunications Act, we had Section 271 that had the 14-point checklist that talked about how if a Bell company meets this checklist so there's local competition, they can then get into long distance. In the 96 Act, there was no distinction made between voice and data. And the truth is, is that technically speaking, as they're moving to packet switch technology, you will not be able to distinguish between voice and data. Uh, so not only did the 96 Act not anticipate a distinction between voice and data, the truth is, is that technologically where we're moving today is that you cannot distinguish between voice and data when it's nothing but ones and zeros that are coming across the line. Uh, so we're there. I mean, technologically we're there, but I think even the assumption that we made in 96 was that there's no distinction in long distance between voice and data. But as Jerry Maguire used to say, show me the money. Because this is all about where the money is in telecommunications today, and it's in long distance data transfer. That's where the money is because of the internet. And so the Bell companies want to get into there, and, and, and I can understand that. I mean, they're bottom line businesses, as all, are all businesses. My point is, is that I feel like that the bottom line for me is, is that we shouldn't be changing the rules in the middle of the game. And especially when they have a very real possibility of hampering, opening up that local loop to competition, which again is still dominated by the Bell companies, 94%. There's not any other industry that we've opened up through the telecommunications industry that is still has that kind of domination by one entity. Not even in broadband. I mean, when we talk about the cables, cable does not dominate broadband like uh, the Bells do in the local loop. So again, I'm not here to beat up on the Bells. I was one that supported Southwestern Bell's uh, entry into long distance in Oklahoma. They got 271 relief, and I was trying, and I tried to be helpful and was helpful, I think, and instrumental in them getting that because they have local competition 
in Oklahoma. I want to see that happen elsewhere in the country. And uh, thanks for your time. Uh, well, in the interest of time, because the vote pen is pending, uh, I think Chairman Tozen is somebody who needs no introduction to this audience. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you very much. Um, let me follow up on, on Steve's comment first. Uh, and, and comment to you that it's always the middle of the game when it comes to telecommunications. If there is a marketplace that is constantly evolving, constantly changing, it's this incredible marketplace where technology rewrites the rules of the game every week. More importantly, the rules of the game have been changed. The Congress in 1996 wrote the rules of the game. They said it takes 14 points, you meet these 14 points, and you can compete and you can get out of the long distance and compete against uh, the long distance carriers, if you're a belt company, you're opening up your local market. Those 14 points are now 1,100 points because of FCC extraordinary regulatory uh, action. 14 points change rules all the way to 1,100 points, and you wonder why only a few states in America have gotten through the process. I don't know if you know it, but when the bill was written in 96, there was a suggestion that we do a drop dead date of 1998 when all this would open up to full competition. And the reason 98 was not accepted is nobody thought it would take as long as 1998 for the FCC to authorize full-blown uh, competition in the telephone market. And so the 98 uh, act was, uh, date was dropped and the 14-point was, uh, was devised instead because people thought they could, they could satisfy the FCC in, in a shorter period of time on 14 points. I'm not dreaming the FCC would turn it into 1,100 points. Secondly, Look at the states that have gotten 271 approval. They finally got through this 1,100-point checklist, where the, where the Bells not only got the support of the local PUCs, but eventually won approval through the Justice Review and the uh, FCC Review. That's where you find a lot of local competition now. That's why you find AT&T competing on its website for local residential customers. Why? Because they have to there. Because the local Bell company can sell now both local and long-distance services to everybody. So the long distance lines are finally saying we better compete for those residential customers. We're going to lose the business. Until that time, they like the status quo. What's the status quo? The status quo is the FCC has gummed this stuff up so bad that AT&T cable sits in this remarkably beautiful position. They can stymie and delay the entry of bell companies into their business, long distance business. They can enjoy an unregulated entry into broadband for cable in the places which they can make the most money, which happens to be the biggest urban areas of America. And they can concentrate their competition with the bell companies in the best markets and business markets without ever, ever going into the residential markets and competing, because that makes the case for, for them to, uh, to let the bells out. But at and Cable loves the status quo. If you like the status quo, believe me, you understand why at and Cable is spending so much money creating all these false organizations and consumer groups to argue against those and Dingle. They've done such a great job of arguing against those and Dingle and he's ad. that Mrs. Dingle told me, she introduced herself to a gentleman that didn't know her the other day, and he said, John, Mrs. John Dingle, are you related to that guy who and Dingle? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hear arguments today, and Mr. Fauci did a great job of talking about the fairness of the situation. Is it fair to have this new advanced service area opening up in America, broadband services coming to America, and having some companies have completely unregulated access to developing their business strategies. No regulations. Having some companies, the cable companies, not having to, for example, provide uh, network elements on an unbundled basis to anyone else. They don't have to resell advanced services to anyone else. They don't have to provide co-location. They don't have to provide you the connection. Nobody's regulating the content of that internet business and broadband for cable. So far. So far. They've got a free hand to do it the way they want. They have 70% of the market, and they like it that way. And the bell companies, who have the other wire in our houses, who are trying to provide DSL services to us, have all these rules and regulations. Current mail books are applicable to them, making it much more difficult for them to offer those services to Americans. So Bob just talked about the fairness of that situation. It's not fair. They have a situation where some of the companies, a few of the companies who are 70% of the market, offering them to the best customers in America, having no regulations on them, and having other companies who want to get into this business, who want to provide the service, having this mess of regulations on them. He's talking about the fairness of that. I want to, I want to pass over that argument. I want to talk about something much more profound to this group, and why it's critical to 
an internet caucus, people interested in this new form of communication, to be profoundly disturbed with the status quo and interested in supporting Tos Antigua. You see, we face a choice right now in America. There are those in this country who like the concept of telephone regulation, who like the idea of regulating content in a connection, sale, resell of services, who like the idea of making telephone networks and communication networks common carriers, where government decides the rates, the terms, the services, the packages, the content. They decide how much you can charge for a package of services and how much you can. There are people in this town who like to do that. You know that. And they would love to extend that form of regulation into the broadband area. They would love one day to have content regulations on broadband, interconnection agreements, uh, co-location agreements, uh, standardizations for interconnections in this area. They would love to have a heavy hand of government all over broadband. And there are those who would like to protect the Internet from that form of regulation that has unfortunately been uh, the way in which the FCC and the government has treated telephone service in America. They would even like one day to be talking about something called universal service in broadband, maybe some subsidies flowing around, like they have a telephone service. And see, the danger is that we got two players in this field. We got telephone companies and cable companies. You got some other peripheral players, but they're the main players. They're the two wires in our homes. And if one is going to provide the service to us on a deeply regulated, subsidized basis, and the other can't, let me tell you what happens around this town. The tension builds. And then we go one way or the other. We either regulate them all or we deregulate them all. You know that. And the test for you and for me is whether we can have the courage right now, before this really takes off in America, for us to say this will be an unregulated world. Government will not regulate content and interconnection and, and agreements and whether or not you're going to package or not package and what can be in a package and what you've got to pay for. It will be that choice or the choice does that dingle make, which is say right now, this new advanced service area is going to be unregulated. It's going to be free of government hands telling us how to make it work and how to run it and how to ask consumers to choose among. And more important, more important, we're going to have both wires competing across America for American customers. So that we got at least two stores in town, hopefully three and four one day, but at least two wires to choose from. So the Americans are never stuck with the position that they got to call the members of Congress and say, why do you let the single provider charge me what they're charging me for this package of services? When are you going to regulate them again? Instead, consumers are calling up and, and saying, I don't like the price cable that's charging me for broadband, and I can answer them. No problem. Call your telephone company. Hopefully call your satellite company, your terrestrial wireless company, too, where you're at. Hopefully charge, call a number of competitors. You see, this is the same debate we had in 1992, when we were talking about whether or not we're going to have a satellite industry to compete against cable. Same debate. It's not about telephone service. This is about the Internet now. It's not just about pictures. This is about data and voice and all that stuff. Logic's right about that. That's where this world is going. And the question is whether this new world of converged services in digital, broadband, high-speed delivery to American consumers is going to be a world where we're stuck with one provider, dominant provider, we've got to pay the price until we go to Congress and get regulations on them, or whether we make a decision today to make sure there are competitors out there reaching across America giving Americans all kinds of options. The same debate from the N92. Do you want one store in town or do you want two or three or four? Do you want government regulating one store in town or do you want the consumer in charge of this marketplace by choosing which player they like better, which product they like better, which packages and service they like better, and then regulating price and terms and conditions by their pocketbook and their, and their feet? I choose that other route every day. And I fought for that in 92 to make sure we had a cable competitor in, in satellite, and I'm going to fight my darnest to make sure we have a broadband competitive cable, too. That's what this fight is all about. And I want a deregulated world, not a regulated one. And you want to join me in that. If you think it's working well, if you think the status quo is good, then look at what's happening in America. I've just got a report in the Wall Street Journal. If you want a copy of this, call our office. We'll give you a copy of this chart. It's an amazing chart. It tells us where cable broadband is being deployed. It goes down the size of cities. Over the eight, in the eight cities, over 1 million, 100% deployment. In the 15 cities, over 500,000, 73% deployment. And you go down the list and you get to 50,000 
population community, you're at 26% employment. And you get down to a 10 or 25,000 population community, which is all I have on the bayou, I promise you. We don't have room to grow, alligators. <laughs> when you get down to Roadside City, 7.6% employment. When you get down to 5,000 to 10, 5, 2,000 to 5,000 population, 2% employment. When you get down to 1,000 to 2,500, 0.7% employment. You like the status quo, you like digital divide. You like the status quo, you like this tension. Some regulated, some unregulated. You like the status quo, you are helping us build a situation where one day Congress is going to have to step in and regulate again in an area where I hope and pray we have a good common sense not to regulate. You like the status quo, you like the idea of dominant players instead of full-blown competition. You like the status quo, you like the FCC rewriting the rules all the time about competition and telephone. Bottom line is Tozan Dingo sets the mark for this century. It says in this new advanced service area, competition is going to be the rule, and deregulation is going to be the rule, and consumer choice is going to be the rule. And in this new service area, Congress is going to keep its hand out of it, and hopefully local governments will as well. And we'll have a full-blown delivery and deployment of those services to everybody in this country as we can get, not just those lucky enough to live in the biggest cities. That's the debate we're going to have. And I hope, it, I hope you agree with me. In the interest of the Internet, in the interest of keeping it free of government regulation, particularly the kind the telephone company brings to the, to the table today, Roseanne Dingle has to pass. Thank you. Have a good to defeat incumbent Democrats in the 1996 election. Uh, he serves on the House Judiciary Committee and along with uh, Congressman John Conyers. He is one of the primary sponsors of the two bills I mentioned earlier that have been proposed as alternatives to the Tass and Jingle bill. And I think we now would like to hear... Thank you very much, and thank you for having me out here today on what I think is a really important bill. Are you guys hot? Anybody out here a little warm? I thought it was just... Billy's rhetoric, but I think it's going to be a different temperature. See, interestingly, last uh, last weekend, uh, I was down in the uh, southern part of the state. You all familiar with the Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, which is wholly within two huge counties. The mass are very bigger than uh, Connecticut, and uh, it was hot down there. So it's actually the, the, the one of the most rainy uh, winters they've had down there. So it's you've seen pictures of the desert in southern Utah, I suspect, everywhere. It was red and green. It was really quite beautiful down there. And uh, the reason I mention that, not just because it's hot here today, uh, but because in the tiny town of Knapp, the whole county has about 5,000 people. What Chris, what does Knapp have? Maybe 3,000 people, 2,000 people? Every citizen of that town has access to real, true broadband. Right now it's radio frequency, but they've got uh, fiber optic cable coming. And so in, in, if you think about the, the map of the West, you know, where nobody lives, Utah is the seventh most urban state in the country. By the way, because everybody lives crowded along the Wasatch Front, it's hard to live out in the desert. Uh, although, with our current technology of moving water through pipelines, uh, not just information, we, uh, I suspect we're going to see some growth on there. But in, in that area, the, the, the loneliest part of the western United States, the least populated part of the country, we have 100% access to broadband uh, in that little town. And so, uh, there are a lot of things we agree on. here. I, I, anybody in this room courageous enough to raise their hand and say, we don't want broadband promulgated? I mean, that's what this is all about. The, the problem with the debate is that there are a lot of confusions out there, a lot of, uh, a lot of apple pie and mother kind of statements that, that are intended, I suspect, to, have to, have to actually obfuscate the, the issue. The first issue is, are we dealing with, with cable as the only possibility in the alternative for broadband? Is cable going to kill our, uh, our telecoms, our local monopolies? Anybody think that's going to happen? Good, then you need to support the canon Congress that your boss to support the canon Congress. Because uh, that's what this whole thing is about. I actually I probably have to stop at this point. But that's what I'm trying. Uh, the fact is, let me just give you a couple of, of points of interest. Um, we, as Billy said, 98% of what Billy said is, is stuff that I agree with wholeheartedly. Billy's my friend, he's a great guy, he's a free market guy. But, but the question is not whether we believe in all these really nice things. 
this where we make these little fine distinctions that will have huge effects on, on where we go in the country. Uh, Billy pointed out that we had the, the 96 bill had 14 points that the, uh, the uh, regional bureaucracy companies had to meet, and that 14 points expanded to 1,100 points. Why? The answer is simple, because the, the bells created the complexity because they didn't want to comply, they didn't want to have to let people uh, come in and, and co-locate with them. So, uh, you know, that, that is something you could disagree on. Fair minds could disagree, and we certainly have heard some of the most brilliant legal minds in the country telling us that, that it is not what I think it is, and that is an attempt to obfuscate on part of the bells, but it is some other inherent problem. But in fact, you've had very little penetration. When we talk about the cables having 70% of the broadband market, we are talking about 7% of the market. We're not talking about 70% of 260 million Americans. We're talking about uh, 7 per 70 percent of 7 percent of 260 million Americans. So we don't have a monopoly out there, but uh, we have also have, fortunately, think heaven in a in a fractionated environment in America. We have companies that have different interests. One of those companies is one of the regionals is, is Quest. Uh, U.S. West, I think many people believe is probably the worst uh, regional bell operating company. Quest took them over. Many people are changing their view right now. Quest unilaterally. Four months ago, five months ago, dropped all of its lawsuits in, in the Montana area and opened the doors for co-location. Uh, Quest, at the time they said we hoped to have all of our lawsuits uh, uh, and, uh, and issues in front of PUCs resolved by the end of next year. Uh, my last uh, last count is that essentially uh, Quest is out of the litigate, entirely out of the litigation business. So why is that? They're out of the, by the way, they just recently uh, begun co-locating in Detroit with, with Ameritech. So, why is it that, that Quest is doing something different from all the rest of the bells? Because Quest has a huge, the Quest company prior to it taking over US West had a huge embedded uh, fiber optic cable system in America. They now have extended that through partnerships all the way through Europe. They are close to having a, a total, uh, a massive connection with Japan. And they have, they have cable in, in Latin America. They're calling themselves now the broadband company. They want to carry. They're at a point where they want people online with lots of data so that their servers, their embedded. Uh, plant will be will be utilized. So, uh, I, I suspect if you could roll the clock back four or five or six years, that the percentage of that 1,100 points that came from Quest may not be on the table. Now, you know, you can all have to make a simple judgment in your own minds about that. But let me just say that the cable folks want uh, the Quest and the Ameritex to stay in business and to work and to provide services they can't provide to their cables. They want to be able to provide DSL to, to a whole uh, raft of folks in America. And let me stand with this point, because it's hot and it's late, and you've heard from a lot of people. If you look at the country and ask your question, what is, and you're counseling your, your uh, congressional bosses about how they should be voting, the question is not cable versus uh, our box. Because if you, if you frame it that way, it's, you're just going to answer on the basis of who gives you the most money. The question has to be, <laughs> I'm glad you think that's funny, because it really is. It's unfortunately funny, because it's painful. But the real question is, how do we get, and from a perspective of looking down from this very high point that we have here in Washington, D.C., on the future and on the nation, how do we get the broadest, quickest dissemination of broadband? And the answer to that is not re-monopolizing the baby bells, not making them invulnerable to the attempts of these other companies to, uh, to uh, uh, use their, to co-locate with them. And then finally, let me point out that uh, AT&T recently bought, uh, remember who did they just buy? One of the... Uh, the CELAC, one of the competitive companies, for $135 million. Mike Andrew Armstrong, who was here the other day, said, it would be crazy, Chris, for me or anybody else to buy any other uh, colo uh, group because if Tozan, as long as Tozan Dingle is in the air in the market, as long as that's overhanging in the market, you, there's no value to these companies. So you've seen lots and lots of bankruptcies. Uh, I'm not just tell you, it is not, I, I cannot believe that, that they hired them to come to Congress and actually say, it's because of bad business plans. But these companies are failing because they have bad business plans. These companies are failing because the R box would not give them access. These companies will not have the ability to, to do the aggressive things that they, they were doing until you make it clear to the R box that they can't have uh, the remonopolization power that will allow them to, to box those folks out. And, and that is a very important thing. You know, there's the capital to do this broadband dissemination is going to come from markets, but it will only come if markets have some confidence. And that's why I think the Tozan Deagle bill is wrong. Let me tell you briefly what our bill does. Um, holy cow, some of these notes are not mine. I got it. That's the right notes, right? The last page for number is different. <laughs> I'm going to say, 
Um, the first thing is going to overturn the Seventh Circuit uh, Court of Appeals case, Gold, uh, Goldwasser, which essentially was the, the Belder argument gives them uh, immunity from uh, antitrust uh, prosecutions. Uh, secondly, we established this very important reason why alternative dispute resolution process, which means instead of 400 issues the same in 400 different places or times, you can bring these together in one place and, and uh, give the competitive groups uh, the ability to actually be heard and move on. And, uh, and finally, uh, we make it a, a certain uh, violation of the sections of the 1996 Telecom Act that constitute uh, evidence of uh, antitrust violations, uh, and we're, we're working to adjust the language on that so that would be uh, probably a pre-patient case rather than what it currently says as a uh, uh, higher standard. So uh, our bill is intended to loosen up, to, to put a little bit of pressure on the regionals and uh, and it's intended also to act as a counterweight to the Tozendingo bill, which I think does nothing more than re monopolize uh, the regional bill offering companies. Thank you for your attention. All right. Uh, plan wind up uh, for our congressional speakers is uh, Congressman Goodlatte is going to come back and make some conclusive remarks. Thank you, Susan. I will also try to be brief. Uh, as you can see, this is an amazingly complex subject. Uh, but what I think is important, and Chris Cannon and I agree, there's a lot of confusion here, but I, I think we would disagree about where it's coming from. And what I ask each and every one of you to do is to keep your eye on the ball. The issue here is what's going to happen to the future of broadband uh, in this country. And that is a completely separate issue in many respects from the issue of local voice telephone service, which we passed legislation in 1996 to address. That legislation has worked. It's working maybe slower than we'd like it to, but it nonetheless is working. And the problem is that if we do not free up all the competitors in this process to roll out broadband access, we're going to pay a very heavy price for holding America hostage for the future simply to work out those problems. And the place we're going to hold them hostage the most Rural areas, smaller cities, and urban inner city areas. And that, I think, is what should dictate what we do here. To respond to a couple of things that Chris said, uh, the CLEX failing. Well, what you have to remember there is that we start out with 300 CLEX. We now have 150 of them. And the reason they're failing is they're not just competing with the bells. They're competing with each other in every community. Dozens of them competing with each other. Nationwide, 150 of them competing with each other. And any business analyst will tell you that there's going to be an enormous shakeout. There's probably room in the market for 20 to 40 of them. So we're going to continue to see a lot of them shake out. A lot of them have bad business models. A lot of them are undercapitalized. And that is the principal reason why we have a problem here. The second thing to keep your eye on the ball with is not really the CLEX that are carrying this argument. The folks who are carrying the argument are major long-distance carriers who do not want this competition in the internet backbone market. And what's happening is that those same companies that are saying, oh, we just bought one seal, we'll never buy another one. Well, when we wrote the Telecommunications Reform Act, the whole plan was local telephone companies go into the long-distance business, the long-distance companies go into the local business. Well, where are the long-distance companies in the local business? They didn't go there. The biggest one went an entirely different route. They bought cable companies. And I think that's a good idea, and I'm glad they're doing it. I'm glad they're rolling out cable modem service. In my hometown of Roanoke, Virginia, I'm about to become a cable modem service subscriber because I can't get DSL service. Why can't I get DSL service? Because the incentives are not there for the heavily regulated bell companies to be in this market competing. And that is what this is all about. It isn't about opening up that local telephone loop. The profitable area there already has burgeoning competition for business service, and the profitable residential lines will have it as well. But 40% of residential phone customer service is subsidized by the telephone company. They take in less money than it costs them to provide the service. So how many CLECs are going to go in to that 40% of the market? They're never going there for that very reason. The, the final point to make is this. If we're going to have this kind of competition on the internet to open up and spur development, go the route that Billy Tozan says. Go the route of competition. 
That's what this bill is all about. One side wants to keep people out of markets. The other side wants them in. If we'll do that, we will truly see the Internet reach all of America in this next few years. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all. I think this has been a terrific uh, exposition of, of the really very different point of views on a subject that uh, is really is being debated on Wall Street in exactly the same fashion. Um, but what we have now is a, a private sector panel, um, and uh, that will give us an opportunity, if you'd like to, to have some Q's and A's uh, with the various exponents of these different points of view. Our first speaker on the private sector panel, i told, is uh, Sue Ashdown. Sue is the executive director of the American Internet Service Provider Association. She's a graduate from the University of Utah. Um, she spent seven and a half years as an advertising executive in Los Angeles, but I, I have to think I'd love to catch you alone sometime and get the stories on that. Um, she is uh, she helped found the uh, first uh, Utah's first internet service provider in 1993. Um, in her work uh, for the uh, Internet uh, Coalition in the in Utah. Uh, she has filed comments and been very active since with all manner of FCC proceedings involving broadband issues. Um, I think our next speaker will be Larry Clinton. Uh, Larry is uh, the Vice President for Large Company Affairs at the U.S. Telecom Association. Um, he's been with USTA for 10 years. Uh, before that, um, he was uh, Vice President for Government Relations and was very much involved in USTA's lobbying on the 1996 Act. He spent time on the Hill, including um, as legislative director for Rick Voucher. And Jeff Eisenach, Jeff Eisenach is president of the Progress and Freedom Foundation, which is a Washington-based direct found in 1993. Um, the foundation um, involved itself in studying the digital revolution and its implications for public policy, uh, and a lot of other related internet uh, and issues as they dovetail with the economy. Um, Jeff uh, also serves on the faculty of George Mason University Law School, where he teaches a course on law and economics and the digital revolution. And he's a contributing editor to the American Spectator magazine. Our last speaker is Tom Kutsky. Is that right? Yes. Um, of Zetel Communications. Uh, he is the former associate general counsel for COVAD, which is one of the companies involved very much in this debate um, as a competitive data carrier. And I'm sure there's more to say about him, but that's all they gave me. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I'll try to keep this brief because we, you know, I know it's been a long lunch and I appreciate you staying here. I'd first like to thank Tim Lord and the Internet Education Foundation for giving me this opportunity. Because frankly, this debate is all about, it, it, it's so much about getting internet access and not just any kind of internet access because I think it's indisputable that all Americans, or most Americans, but a vast majority of Americans already have internet access. It's all about getting fast internet access out to them. And, and in the debate so far, um, I haven't seen any internet service providers uh, being invited to participate in the debate. And we, after all, have been bringing internet access to uh, America since uh, the early 90s, well before the Bell operating companies were aware of the internet or decided to get involved in it. And, so I think that we have some relevant comments to make. Um, I'm not going to go into, uh, I have a handout that you can get as you're on your way out the door if you didn't get one on the table that, that specifically addresses the issues that internet service providers, aside from all the issues that cable companies or phone companies or anybody else has with um, uh, House Bill 1542, we have our own issues with, these, uh, with this bill. And, um, you can read more about it in there. But I do want to say one thing. I was really interested to hear Congressman Cannon. Utah is my home state. I was interested to hear him mention Kanab, which is a beautiful area, because uh, we have a very good supporter in the Utah Internet Service Provider Coalition um, in Kanab who has been fighting with us for a long time, even though actually he's not served by a Bell company, but recognizes the importance of broadband to his community and wants to be able to offer it not just in a wireless capacity but over the phone network as well. And just this week I got uh, the latest response from Quest on uh, the Utah Coalition's uh, request to the Public Service Commission to, to, to deal with some of the issues that have prevented us from being able to roll out 
broadband. We hear, we've heard a lot today about how uh, the Bell companies are unable to roll out broadband because the incentive isn't there and uh, we need to remove some of the regulatory hurdles. What I have in this document is a response from Quest basically to the Utah Internet Service Providers who are desperate to sell this product, who have been fighting to sell this product since 1998, and Quest is telling the Internet Service Providers in Utah, sorry, we can't tell you when, where, anything that they were ordered to do as part of their merger with U.S. West, as a condition in merging with U.S. West, they were told that they were going to deploy, take the, take the money from the sale of rural exchanges and deploy it uh, in DSL and rural areas. We can't share any of that information with you because the federal regulations don't say that we have to. Um, and if it's, not, if it's not in the federal regulation, then sorry, we're not going to do it. That makes it absolutely impossible for an internet service provider to participate in the market. If our only knowledge of when DSL is going to be rolled out is when we pick up our local newspaper and open it up and see, ah, DSL is here, we're 10 steps behind. We can't participate as competitors in the market. We can't offer competitive choice to people in the market. And I'll tell you frankly, it, this, this is this, the tiniest sliver of the tip of a huge iceberg that we've been fighting for a long time. There are real issues, real reasons that internet service providers have been prevented from bringing DSL uh, service to their subscribers. And Toes and Dingle doesn't address those. In fact, Toes and Dingle goes the other way and says, let's get rid of the regulations, the, the, the minimal regulations that are the only ones that these companies are willing to comply with. And I would say that actually they're not complying with them. When I hear the argument that, uh, that they have to comply with all these regulations, they're so onerous, the cable companies don't have anything uh, close to it, all I can say is that my experience has been that they've been willfully violating those regulations for quite some time. And, um, and, and the effect is the same. They may be regulated, but they're pretending as though they're not. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's, our, that's our view on the subject. <laughs> I'll turn it over to Larry. Uh, I, I'd also like to thank, I'm Larry Clinton, uh, I'm with the United States Telecom Association. Uh, we represent a thousand local telephone companies, including uh, the four remaining bells. I would also like to thank the Internet Caucus for putting this on. I uh, uh, looked at the RSVP list. We had uh, virtually 100 staffers uh, respond, uh, and I counted we have nearly that many in the room, and I'm delighted to see so many of you have stayed. I'll try to keep you here by not, keep, by not speaking too long. Um, I would like to focus on the items that I suspect your bosses may have to vote on uh, in a couple of weeks. Just so that everybody knows the status of this legislation, Tozan Dingle has been approved by the House Commerce Committee. Uh, the expectation is that it could be on the House floor uh, before the congressional recess for July 4th. And so your bosses are going to probably have to vote on this. And I'd like to focus on two voting issues, uh, and uh, then we can move to questions after the other speakers. The one voting issue is on the bill as a whole. And you've heard an awful lot about that. I'd like to try to crystallize this a little bit for you. Congressman Cannon asked a terrific question. Who here is against broadband deployment? Nobody in the room raised their hand. I suspect that that's true. All of us want to have the digital divide bridged. The only way that you can assure to your member of Congress that the digital divide is going to be bridged, that there is going to be not only competitive deployment, but deployment of some broadband service, is to pass the Tozan Dingle bill. It is the only bill that has been proposed that has a mandate for 100% deployment of broadband services within the next five years. If you want to guarantee broadband deployment to your state, to your congressional district, there is only one vehicle in the Congress that does that, and that is the Tozan Dingle bill. In order to have nationwide deployment, naturally, you're going to have to do away with the artificial barriers that not only exist between states, but within states, called LATA boundaries, that currently block that sort of deployment. So here's your trade-off. If you want broadband deployment nationwide, you have to allow this to occur. Now, I won't go back through all the arguments that you've already heard about the fact that, uh, that for the most part, the telcos are the second entry into that market, and therefore not subject to monopoly-style regulation. Cable services already supply broadband technology, and that's why we are not changing the rules of the game. Congressman Largent had an interesting analysis where he said, well, this is like, you know, uh, if the uh, Lakers said we're going to do away with anybody under, 
you know, six foot one for the second half. But for those of you who are basketball guys, that's Allen Iverson kicking out of the game. Um, that is not like this. This is more like if the world champion uh, Yankees decided they were going to challenge the world champion Lakers to a game of basketball, to, to a game of baseball. But they said to the Lakers, you guys can only field five guys. And the Lakers would say, well, wait a minute. A baseball team has nine guys. And, and the Yankees would say, oh, no, 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 you guys always play with five in your game, so when you play our game, we want you to play with five also. It is a different game in re with respect to telephone competition. You need to understand what is in the Tozan single bill with respect to competition for local telephony service. All the rules that existed in the 1996 Act, that's Section 251, 271 remain 100% in force. All the current provisions dealing with local telephony competition remain in force as they exist now. What Tozan Dingle Bill does is establish a broadband policy and says if we're going to play this other game, not local telephony, not voice competition, but broadband competition, then the telephone company should operate under the same rules same number of players, if you will, as the cable companies and everybody else. So we sweep away the rules, and in return for that, we guarantee deployment. So number one issue that you're going to have to counsel your boss to vote on is do you want to vote for the bill? If you want deployment, Tozan Dingle bill is your answer. Now the second issue, unfortunately, is a little bit more complex, and that is probably going to be the largest amendment. The largest amendment is probably going to be on something called line sharing. And you're going to try to figure out, how should my boss, boss vote on line sharing? And line sharing sounds so friendly. Why shouldn't we share these lines? And the proponents of line sharing are going to say to you, this is how we're going to have local competition. And the question you have to ask, and have your boss ask, is local competition for what? Because if you want local competition for dial tone, local telephony service, you don't want line sharing. Because line sharing is the way a CLEC or a DLEC, that is a competitive carrier, says we don't want to compete for local telephony service. We only want we don't want the whole line. We want you to share that line with us so we can only go after the high-end data customers because that's where the money is. We don't want to compete for local telephony competition. Under Toes and Dingle, if a competitor wants to compete for both in both games, local telephony and broadband, then they need to buy the whole line so that they compete for both services. That's not line sharing. And the requirement that the telephone companies must sell the whole line to anybody who wants at rock bottom prices called Telric pricing, virtually nothing, remains 100% intact under Toes and Dingle. In addition, if a company wants to compete only for the data services, there remains in effective law a requirement that the Bell Company must sell them any DSL service that they offer, that is the phone company offers, must be resold and available again at wholesale rates. The only thing that the Toes and Dingle Bill says is that if a telephone company deploys fiber technology, very expensive technology to deploy to fill out this 100% requirement, then they don't have to share that. If, they're, if it's the traditional copper line, they have to share it. If they want to buy the whole line, telephone company has to do it. So line sharing is a bad amendment. You want to vote against line sharing if you want competition in both markets. One last point, I'd, I'd just like to quickly respond on the ISP issues. Under Toes and Dingle, the telephone companies not only retain all of their requirements to comply with any ISP request for interconnection, carriage, co-location, whatever. And by the way, cable companies don't have any of those regulations. But those requirements for ISPs are actually expanded in the Tozan Dingle Bill. Now, I don't know 
what's in this document that you have. You know, this is the first time I've heard that the telephone companies not only should have to comply with the regulations, but they should comply with some things beyond the regulations that we want. But I don't know what's in that. But I can tell you that at least some of the ISP organizations in town are supportive of the Tozan Dingle. I'm reading here from a letter from the United States Internet Industry Association. It says, on behalf of the members of the U.S. Internet Industry Association, I'm writing to ask for your support in favor of H.R. 1542, the Internet Freedom and Broadband Deployment Act. Our efforts are directed at the growth and well-being of the Internet industry for the pursuit of public policies in support of faster and better and more cost-effective access to customers. We believe H.R. 1542 is consistent with those goals. Now, I understand perhaps some ISPs would like more, and they should probably want more from the cable industry also, but if you want total access for all ISPs, Tozan Dingle does that also. I suggest you vote for the bill and vote against lawn chair. I suggest you vote against the bill and you vote for a line share. One of the overriding things you've heard today um, is that somehow we can say that voice regulation, and we can keep voice competition going, um, and yet we can have a different set of rules for data services <laughs> and data regulation. That's frankly not the case and not possible anymore in today's digital environment. Uh, I'm here representing Retail Communications, which is the largest residential uh, voice CLEC in the United States. We have 400,000 customers. We didn't exist two years ago. Uh, we do now. We're often serviced in 80 states throughout the country. Residential only. We heard about, maybe I have a bad business plan or something, but uh, uh, we are competing very successfully for the residential voice market. Um, we're providing service throughout the states of New York, and Texas, uh, Michigan, Illinois, California, etc. I used to work for the largest independent uh, select provider of DSL services in the United States. Uh, so I've communications company, which had uh, 250,000, maybe 300,000 DSL subscribers by now. Guess what? We both support line share. Um, Zetel is not threatened by line share. In fact, the, the point of line sharing and of unbundling in general is to set up a system that the Act did, that Congress did in the 1996 Act, was to provide rungs for competitive entrants to enter the market. Uh, line sharing is one rung that, that a carrier could use to climb up the ladder. Um, the Zetel operates in a different manner. We use different unbundled elements. Uh, the fact that one set of unbundled elements exists doesn't threaten our business plan, and in fact actually helps our business plan, because in, in the competitive industry, a rising tide does tend to lift all boats. The fact that CELEC can, uh, that COVAC can be successful in providing uh, a residential data service to somebody um, helps Zetel in the end, because as people get grown more accustomed to choice over time, uh, they'll be more responsive to other types of competitive choice. The fact is, we can't sit here and say right now how local competition is going to happen, which business plan is the best. One of the reasons why we start off with 350 business plans and now we're down to 150, and maybe in two years we'll be back up to 300 again, is because people are trying and they're experimenting with things. The genius of the 1996 Act was that it provided a context and a regulatory framework uh, in which different business models can have a shot at succeeding. What Tosin Digital Bill is about at its core is essentially picking a particular form of entry model. Uh, in this sense, it's a form of industrial policy. We're essentially saying we really don't want uh, young startup competitive upstarts to get into the broadband business or get into the data business. What we really want there is we want the what I consider the battling duopolists. Uh, we want to have cable and telephone companies be able to slug it out without having to worry about pesky entrants like internet service providers that Sue represents or companies that I've worked for in the past. Um, I think you're going to expect competition out of the battling duopolis. It's going to look a lot like uh, saying that uh, Rock and Sock and Robots is a boxing match. It's not, uh, in the end. It's going to be a game. We've actually seen this in the cable context um, with the satellite television. Uh, Chairman Tozen actually uh, made an interesting point about the 1992 Cable Act, that we're really in the same debate. I actually would agree with him on that part. We, we are in the same debate. Uh, what he didn't describe was one of the provisions of the Nelson Cable Act that he actually supported and um, sponsored, and it was a great idea, was he essentially said that um, you, the cable company, need to share access to your programming with your entrance, DirecTV or EchoStar at the time. Essentially, that's what the unbundling rules in the 1996 Act are. They're the same as the program access rules were in the 1992 Cable Act. So I would encourage you all to kind of stick by the bill uh, the act is working 
Uh, companies like Zetel are out there with hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Uh, companies like Covid are out there with several hundred thousand subscribers as well. And what really can't happen is to change the rules in the middle of the game again. Uh, we are the major critical uh, facet that uh, both my employer and former employer share is that the key constraint in our ability to build out to the next 20 states or the next 20 markets is whether or not um, Wall Street believes that the rules of the game are going to be in place, that what we were able to do in our first 10 states, we can do in the other 40. And that's absolutely what Congress does have in control right now. So I would urge you to uh, support the Large Amendment uh, and then vote against the bill. <laughs> Well, let me wrap things up, and I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, the Progress for Freedom Foundation, to begin with, is a think tank. We study the digital revolution and its implications for public policy. Uh, we're broadly supportive. We're supported by Oracle and Intel and Compaq and uh, IBM and a lot of, of what people would call internet companies. Uh, we're also supported by some Orbox, by some cable companies. So I, I'm not here representing anybody or anything other than my own views. Uh, and, and, I, and I want to start by saying that, having said that, um, let, let me begin by concurring very strongly with something that Billy Pozian said, uh, and that is that uh, we really do have a choice between whether or not we're going to move in the direction of a more regulated or a less regulated internet. And, and that's because something that uh, really is at the a core premise of everything we do at the Progress and Freedom Foundation is that the computer industry and the communications industry are getting married. And they're two very different beasts. One of those beasts is traditionally the most regulated industry in the United States, the communications industry, and the other is as unregulated an industry as you can possibly imagine, the computer industry. But the internet is the marriage. Mm -hmm. The internet is precisely the definition of the convergence, the bringing together of the personal computer uh, and, of the, uh, and of the communications infrastructure. And, and one of the things that I think happens so often in these debates, it's bizarre, uh, is that you will see people have a discussion about what ought to happen with the internet and then turn to telecommunications policy as though that's a different topic. It's not a different topic. You plug the computer into the wall and when you do that, you are plugging into Larry Clinton or you are plugging into Jim Sigoni or you are plugging into one of the telecommunications companies. It is part of Sorry for the <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Larry. The fact is, it's all one debate. And and as we look at, you know, where are we going? Are we going in the direction of a regulated internet, or are we going in the direction of an unregulated internet? As we look at the debate before us now, we're looking at the front lines of that debate. We're looking at the at the battle lines where we're where we're going to make a decision. Now, should we go in the direction of additional regulation? Should we go in the direction of less regulation? I'll come back to that, but let me tell you why I think it's so important and something that hasn't been discussed here yet today. There, there are at least three things at going on in the United States economy today, only two of which are being talked about as economic issues typically, and I don't think the Bush administration should get a lot of credit for this. One of the things that's being talked about as an economic issue is the fact that the Federal Reserve stepped on the brakes too hard last year and uh, interest rates got too high and taxes, I would say, you know, a lot of people think are too high, I agree. Uh, and so what we need to do is we need to adjust macroeconomic policy to get the economy going again. Well, that's, I agree with that. I think that's a good thing. Certainly we're all debating it and talking about it as an important issue. Second thing that's clearly wrong, to trivialize it or to bring it down to the small point, is we can't keep the lights on in California. And more broadly, energy policy seems to be really screwed up. And we're all focused on that, and we're talking about that, and that's really important, too, as a macroeconomic issue. But look at the high-tech economy. The high-tech economy, which for five years between 1995 and 2000 was responsible for 40% of all GDP growth, two-thirds, according to the Federal Reserve, two-thirds of productivity growth in the United States. We had this huge explosion of productivity after decades of very slow productivity growth, huge explosion of productivity due to the explosion of the high-tech sector. We held inflation down one percentage point below where it would otherwise have been. We had an explosion of job growth. All of those things happened in large measure because of the high-tech sector of the economy, which is now imploded. And, and let me say importantly, in two very distinct phases. The first phase of the implosion happened in, in early 2000 when the dot-coms collapsed and everybody figured out that drcoop.com didn't have a business model. Right? So the NASDAQ, which peaks a little over 5,000 last March, falls to 3,500 last May, 
and everybody says we're having we're having some sort of dot com implosion. We did have a dot com implosion, but guess what? It didn't affect the economy. And the reason is those companies were never worth very much. They never employed very many people. They made no substantial contribution to economic growth. The dot com implosion was not a big deal for the macro economy. But last August, starting last August, something very different happened. The Nasdaq, which had recovered over four thousand for the whole summer, and the economy, which had tripped along quite nicely all through the summer of two thousand uh, of two thousand. Suddenly, you start to see huge layoffs at places like Lucent spreading to Cisco and Dell and Intel and Hewlett Packard and canceled plant expansions and, plant and canceled new plant growth and huge layoffs. The largest single source of layoffs in the U.S. economy this spring is the tech sector. So the first point I want to make to you that I think is urgent is that this is an issue of urgency. People would say, well, you know, do we have to do it now? telecom stuff, does it have to come back? We passed the Telecom Act five years ago, isn't that enough? The answer is no, the tech sector is not okay. The tech sector does need some policy changes to move forward. Now, now I come back to the question, which direction is more likely to help the tech sector, including the internet, including the telecommunications sector? Should we go more in the direction of regulation or more in the, in the, in the direction of less regulation? The, the Cannon Bill essentially would impose double jeopardy in the Orbox. It would say it's not only enough to have this huge regulatory morass imposed on the last mile of the telephone plant, but we need to, on top of that, put on a whole other layer, which is antitrust. <clears throat> the, the alternative is to go in the direction of Tozan Dingle. And what Tozan Dingle simply says is, we're going to let two monopolies that are entrenched in their own marketplaces with competition on margins compete for a new marketplace on equal terms. The cable companies have a very, very high market share in the market for multiple channel video services coming down the pipe to you. They have 68% of all American homes. <coughs> they essentially have a very strong market share in that market, and they have some competition on the fringes, mostly from satellite providers. The telephone companies have a very, local phone companies have a very, very high, similarly strong market position in the market for local telephone service with some competition from CLACs and some really important competition which people don't talk about from these little gizmos, which are increasingly used as a replacement for even the first line, but certainly the second line into that one. So we've got these two companies, these two sets of companies, both of them very strong, but there is no broadband market today. Somebody said we're only talking about 7% of homes passed. One of the two sets of monopolies is able to go into that broadband marketplace, compete entirely unfettered, unfettered do so with no restrictions of any kind, and guess what? They're getting 70% of the business. The other one is being forced to do so under all of the restrictions that apply to it in its home market. Okay. And the proposal in Tozi and Dingle is just as simple as it can be, and that is Regulate the two of them as they're currently regulated. Cable companies are regulated through their franchise agreements by the cities. Our box are more regulated, but regulated by the FCC and by the state PUCs. Leave them regulated in their home markets, but as they compete for this new marketplace, which defines the internet, defines the future of the internet, let them compete on equal terms and let them compete unregulated, not regulated. Do not bring the cable franchise morass onto the broadband pipe. Do not bring new open access regulations onto the broadband pipe from the cable side, and do not bring the entire set of telecom, plain old telephone service regulation onto the broadband pipe from the telephone side. Now, again, at some point, maybe this is a matter of philosophy. Uh, if you believe that uh, we can do better, that the, a heavily regulated set of government, government regulated entities will do a better job more rapidly building out the broadband pipe you're for Cannon or you're against Tozan Dingle, if you believe that at the end of the day, like the rest of the internet, like everything that defines the computer sector, everything that defines Silicon Valley, everything that has defined this explosive uh, growth of the high-tech sector over the past decade, if you believe that that set of rules is the one that ought to apply, then Tozan Dingle's a no-brainer. And I think it's just that simple and would put it to you in those terms. We will either regulate more or less, and now is the time to decide. Thank you. Uh, that's the end of our panel speakers. And uh, 
I would just like to thank again Kim Morton. Kim, raise your hand. Kim Morton. Thank you. Um, and, and if you thought this was great, I really do think this is great. Um, I let you know that uh, the, the third of the series of the broadband educational events will occur right here in this room on July 12th. Come back and tell your friends. Um, it's been a long afternoon, but I think that's a great one. Our panelists are available for some Q&A, uh, or if you feel like you just need to get back to the office and just want to start filing out, they'll also be just sticking around. You can talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Are there any pressing questions from the floor right now? All right, why don't you all stick around? We can answer your questions. Yeah, that's true. No, we don't.